potential game changer in cancer treatment. Some doctors hailing it as the biggest breakthrough since chemotherapy. But what it does is it teaches the immune system to fight cancer. Now it's unclear whether or not it will stay away or whether or not it worked. 14 of 16 patients went into complete remission. And so this builds on about a decade of work in gene therapy to allow- Now we have a blueprint for how we can attack cancers in general. There's a quote on my wall, which is never doubt that a small group of people can change the world. In fact, it's the only thing that ever has. Twelve years ago, I get diagnosed with stage four metastatic disease. From two weeks prior being a healthy guy to you've got six to 18 months to live. Number one cause of death in the U.S. under the age of 85 is cancer. When the fall comes, trees will reabsorb nutrients out of the leaves and the leaves will fall to the ground. That's a very good metaphor for normal cell death. Cancer cells have learned how to die the wrong way. So all of our cells live in these flasks. We're going to expose them to DCs in order to make a vaccine. There was this notion coming from a number of labs that immune cells could both recognize tumor and kill it. It started in the early 70s. We saw that uh, certain strains of mice infected with leukemia viruses got sick and others did not. And it was obvious that the immune system was playing a major role there. So instead of directly treating the cancer, immune therapy treats the patient's immune system so that it can treat the cancer. I'm going to be mixed in with the cells and then I'm going to look at them under the microscope so that I know how many there are. Here's the bad news. Cancers don't just sit there waiting for the immune system to respond. They're very, very active in their own right. I'm trying to make it a little bit more compact. The very first patient that I treated with a hormone called interleukin-2 had a complete response to their cancer. And it wasn't until that first patient in 1984 responded to interleukin-2 that we actually realized that it could happen. Before then, we didn't know whether immunotherapy would ever work. Steps. They'd come in, we'd draw some blood, we'd make a cancer vaccine, and then once in a while their tumors all melted away. So that was exciting, but it's 5 to 10 percent of the stage 4 patients. I ended up doing the immunotherapy and walked out, no evidence of disease. The Society for Immunotherapy of Cancer was started 30 years ago during the first revolution of immune therapy. Virus. If we were going to have a future as a society, it had to be based on the very best science. We had to keep the field alive until the next great advance. The problems of the immune response to cancer in humans are complex, too complex for any single individual to solve. This little statue, of course, is the myth of uh, Sisyphus who is constantly trying to push a huge rock up a hill only to see it slide down again. You walk into one room and a patient is responding, but you walk into another room and the treatment has not worked. SITSI was organized to try and partner the National Cancer Institute with the investigators, both in the academic community and the biotechnology community. We have industry, government, patients, patient advocacy groups, all coming together really with the common purpose of promoting the improvement of patients' lives through immunotherapy. Tumor cells that have been irradiated have less deaths. It was, you know, three, four hundred people, but all doing cancer immunotherapy. And so that became a great forum for really connecting with the other people in this field. Cancer pharmacology and drug delivery. SITSI was filling the gap for this transition from the laboratory development to actually getting it in a clinic. There's the cells at the bottom of the flask there. Hopefully they're going to be a nice cure for my mice. We have to make humanized antibody. We cannot use mouse antibody. It turned out to be much more difficult than we thought it would be. We had things like interleukin-2 and interferon. But after that, there were many years where there really weren't new agents. While it was exciting to be involved in an area that had so much promise, we didn't really have a lot of clinical success to rest our hats on. The whole field of tumor therapy by the, I don't know, by the 
80s at least, was uh, beginning to fall into disrepute. This was going to have to be a lifelong passion, and I was going to have to be really, really persistent in the face of a lot of negative reactions. Tell me what you're up to today. Then the checkpoint inhibitors came, and we realized that this was the obstacle we'd been fighting against, and that immune therapy was actually going to be much bigger than we realized. It was a eureka moment in a sense. But now we have a blueprint for how we can attack cancers in general. There have been historic developments in the field of tumor immune therapy. Early on, we've known that melanoma was a very sensitive to treatment with immunotherapy. Understanding exactly how that was working at the molecular level really led to the development of what has been called the T-cell checkpoint inhibitors. So these are the happy cells. They are ready to crosstalk with other immune cells and activate them. Instead of stimulating the immune system the way we tried to do with interleukin-2, we can take a different approach of taking the breaks off the immune system. And there are two major breaks. One is CT4. The other is PD-1. It's the ultimate personalized treatment. You take a patient's own T cells and you have to react against a unique antigen that's present in that patient's cancer and none others. The drug is actually the T cell. What we're trying to do is learn how to harness them and drive them in a productive way that mediates both clinical activity and that does so in a way that's tolerable for patients. With the checkpoint inhibitors, I think we have a very different era. We've learned how to grow those cells, and we know how to genetically engineer them. Because this is really a legend, and then you can move, move that over here, yeah. move that up. Now, there's no question in anybody's mind, anywhere, that immunology plays an important role in cancer biology and cancer treatment. It was a demonstration for the first time that simply stimulating the body's immune system could make large and highly spread cancers uh, disappear. And we have a big opportunity because very complex problems can be tackled with the modern technology. The challenge now is to understand why some people don't respond. I don't know how it became part of the fabric of the society, but I can't imagine now having a SITSI meeting without uh, the checkpoint playing. The checkpoint's a SITSI's house band. It's made up of a group of doctors that are SITSI members. They're pretty awesome. <laughs> A society that had 100 to 200 members probably has 1,500 members. SITSI really views that as its mission to bring all the critical players together so that they can learn and plan how they're going to work together. Today, we have newer approaches, newer drugs, newer ideas, and already we're seeing from the early trials really dramatic responses. To look at how that was and how it was like we were kind of the, the boots on the ground, like, no, this is a real thing. Come on, guys. Really, it's a real thing. And then to now see it have exploded in really the past two or three years, just even coming to the SITSI meetings. It drew scientists. It drew biotech people. It drew big pharma people. So that in one meeting, you could walk around and essentially find anything that you would like to further your research, to apply your research to an important problem. Somebody comes out of left field and says, you know, I have this information, we should meet because I think it's connected to what you just presented. We're sending SITSI representatives to the lung cancer meeting, to the liver cancer meeting. We're having a patient forum for the first time. There's a lot of innovation taking place on multiple fronts, and there is an ability to tackle complex programs like cancer immunotherapy with a big team science approach. One of the things that the Society for Immunotherapy of Cancer is doing is really getting that education to the people that can have the greatest impact on the patients. Now that now the field has really made it, it also brings people together that can help fund the expansion of this field and get drugs developed more quickly and to patients more quickly. Never doubt that a small group of people can change the world. In fact, it's the only thing that ever has. I think the society has helped support that, given us voice to talk about things like cure.
incredibly exciting time in cancer immunotherapy. We've not only got an understanding of the most critical targets to go after to drive the immune system to treat cancer, but now we've got agents and actual therapeutics to target them. And that's going to likely change the face of cancer treatment over the years to come. We are now seeing approvals for more and more cancers, and we're also seeing combinations of immunotherapy be particularly effective. Not only can you combine immunotherapies with standard therapies for cancer, but that they can actually synergize and work together more effectively than either one independently. You have standard chemotherapy classic cancers. One of them is Hodgkin's disease. Suddenly you're wondering, maybe we should start with an immunotherapy and only use chemotherapy if the immunotherapy fails. We won't need chemotherapy for Hodgkin's disease and all the long-term side effects associated with that. It'll be like treating the common cold. It's a completely new era for immunotherapy, but number one, it comes back to the patients. It is really gratifying to see that in the last few years, this is really coming to fruition, and we now can clearly see the real impact that this is going to have in a way that really offers significant hope to patients. I think now we are challenging ourselves to get to the cure. It's clearly the future. As some people like to use the term, we're at the uh, end of the beginning. The future is looking at prevention. It's at having cancer vaccines that are gonna prevent cancer from developing. Three, four years ago, we were helping about 50% of people with, with cancer. We're up to about 55%. That's a lot. But there's still 45% of people that we don't help. Let's face it, we're not there yet. I think the holy grail in the field is to identify a predictive biomarker, something that we could measure early on in the patient that would tell us what they are likely to respond to. Uh, these are some of the liver cancer projects. These are some of the melanoma projects. We're gonna be able to get someone's blood sample and someone's tumor sample, and we're gonna know what to do. To have played a role, to have been part of the team that creates something, that's huge. It's easier for us because your goal is always thinking you're gonna help a patient. It's nice to see those stories when you see something turn around as drastically as this field has. You just gotta kinda of stand by, this is what I believe in. Good to see you. All of that is very gratifying to watch after these difficult beginnings. It's curing a minority of patients now, but that fraction is getting bigger and bigger as we learn more about it. The fact is, is that we're getting now clinical results that we've never gotten before using the immune system for cancer treatment. If we leave that kind of therapy for our children, I think that could be the best thing that we could do with our careers. How are you seeing it being used in research labs across the country and in patients? So the question is, can it really take care General of General President Jimmy Carter said today his most recent brain scan shows no sign of cancer. To see the science come into fruition right now is just a remarkable moment. Now last year, Vice President Biden said that with a new moonshot, America can cure cancer. Instead of talking to patients to try to get them a few more, months of survival and talking to patients about where they went on their last vacation, where they're going on their next vacation. And that's a completely different experience for an oncologist.